it's like a bolt of lightning came through to me and said, this is the person you're meant to be with. It was bizarre. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman, and you're listening to No Filter, candid conversations with fascinating people. A lot can happen in 30 years of someone's life. You can build a solid career, meet the love of your life, have a baby, mourn the loss of your dad, enjoy the family that you've built, grow your career, and then watch everything implode. Angela Bishop is one of Australia's best-known entertainment reporters. She's been on every red carpet at every awards ceremony in Australia, Hollywood and London, and she has met a lot of celebrities. In fact, I wouldn't be going out on a limb here to say she's almost met every celebrity ever. Ange joins me now to talk about it all, the ups and the downs, the red carpets, and the moment that her life split in two. Here's Angela Bishop. Congratulations, Angela Bishop, on 30 years. In the same job, that makes it sound bad. (laughs) But that's an extraordinary (laughs) achievement in media. Yeah, look, I'm getting used to it. People are saying, 30, that's amazing. And I'm going, if only I was still 30. What's 30? And and I realised that, yes, for more than half my life, I have been substantially more than half my life, been at Network 10, which is not something you ever imagine when you walk in on day one, let me tell you. And certainly I'm sure millennials today think it's the scariest thing they've heard in their lives. You know, millennials who don't stay anywhere for longer than nine months. Well, it's funny you say that because I, I was talking to the team here, many of whom are millennials, and I was trying to say, look, I know that there's this hunger to have a new job, a promotion, move here, don't stay too long. But I showed them a slide with a whole lot of people on the slide and you were one of those people, I have to say, that have been in their jobs for a long time and that have just gotten better and better and better known for what they do and improved at it. And so I think that that's almost something that's been lost It's that 10,000 hour thing, isn't it? That if you do something, what do they say? If you do something for 10,000 hours, you get good at it. You know, practice makes perfect, I suppose, in that thing. I don't feel that necessarily. I am always striving to do better still and I'm always striving to do more things and accept more challenges and, you Mm. know, embrace this world, the digital world and all of the new opportunities that are out there. And, you know, I don't hark back to the good old days when we were – sticking tapes in machines and stuff in any shape, way or form. I I love all the new technology and I love embracing the possibilities it gives us to uh, improve the way we deliver information and stories to people. Mm. How has it changed your job in terms of covering entertainment and celebrities? How has technology and the new world changed for you? It's changed enormously. So although I started at Channel 10 in 1989, I didn't become arts and entertainment reporter till 1994. And then to have an arts and entertainment round in the, in the evening news bulletin was unheard of. You had your police round, sport, courts, medical, everything else you could possibly want, but not that. So I sort of had to be guided by what was of interest. And I, I had to fight to get stories in the bulletin, as you can imagine, let alone first break, you know, which you aspire to, to be in the first Before break the first of the news. Before the first commercial break. Indeed, yeah, and to, you know, be in the top stories of the day. I suppose that's the first change I've noted. You think of an evening news bulletin now without an entertainment story in it and you'll be hard-pressed. It's interesting to think about that because something that I've always noticed as well and many people have that the format of news tends to be very much based on men's interests. Mm. I mean, why sport? Why not arts and entertainment? Why not fashion? Why not? Like who said that every news bulletin has to have a sports section? Mm. And similarly, in terms of if it bleeds, it leads. So there's an emphasis on crime. There's an emphasis on sport. This idea of news has always been fed to us through a male lens. What do you think changed? Like when did the blokes in the newsroom, because it pretty much always has been and still is predominantly blokes, when did they start going, oh, because it's all about ratings, oh, maybe some people are interested in watching some of these other things? It started to change around the late 90s when the O.J. Simpson trial happened. So everyone in America was busy watching the White Bronco, watched all that unfold live on their televisions and then watched the trial. And that was sort of where the taste for reality television came from, for watching people's lives unfold before you on television. We got a taste of that over here because we were sort of going, my goodness, they're just watching this on television the whole time, actual real life. And it's no coincidence that it's 
the Kardashians and the Hiltons that ended up being the first uh, reality TV ones because it was Robert Kardashian who was O.J. Simpson's lawyer in the trial and mm. and Chris Jenner was best friends with the Hiltons, uh, Paris's mum, who were good friends with the Simpsons and all the rest of it and that those so it families, all it all stems from that. And then as soon as that trial was over, there was this hunger for people to watch mm. more things. So as the news bled into entertainment, if you like, entertainment bled back into news. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And it's funny you say the end of the 90s because that was when I started editing Cosmo and that's when we went from having models on the cover, supermodels in fact, to celebrities. Yep, you're right. And it changed almost overnight around that same time. And suddenly celebrities enabled us to tell more stories and have more depth than when you have just a model on the cover. 100%. And so you had all these personalities to mine from, if you Mm. like. And they have what people might not know is that in ratings, you can see minute by minute breakdowns. So you can literally see... When we do a story about politics, people change the channel or they switch off. When we have a story about Oprah, ratings go up or you can see when people lose interest Mm. in the same way you can online. So the metrics are very responsive for TV. So I guess when they saw, oh, people are interested, it's not just dumb chick stuff, Yeah, this entertainment business. (laughs) But you're right. I mean, I could fill a segment on the news. I could do a segment, the length of a sports segment, with interesting noteworthy, uh, relevant information. But why is it sport and why not? Yeah. I, and, and that's reflected throughout our community. I, I would ask the same question, why is there this incredible amount of federal and state government funding for sport and this by comparison minute amount of funding for the arts when it could be evened up a little? Mm. Of the 10,000 hours you need to become an expert, uh-huh. how many do you reckon you've spent on a red carpet? <laughs> Yeah, I'm probably nearly there or in an aeroplane getting to the red carpet, certainly. I uh, have stood in the in the lubes, in the nude lubes, my, my shoe of choice on the red carpet. The lubes, the nude, oh, nude, the nude lubes, Louboutins. Louboutins, yeah, they're my favourite red carpet shoe. Once I broke them in, I've had the same pair for six years. Once I broke them in, they are super comfortable. I can wear them for a long period of time Can now. you talk me through how it actually works? Breaking in a pair of lubes or the red carpet? <laughs> <laughs> Your preparation sure. for being on a red carpet and what sure. it's actually like and how the lubes factor into that. Okay, no worries. So let's take the uh, the Golden Globes as an example. Uh, we'll have to start filing for the shows I file for, so I'll be doing live crosses throughout Studio 10. I'll cover the red carpet live from Studio 10. So I'll need to be ready to go on the red carpet by about 1 p.m. LA time, which means I'll need to get there at about 11 a.m. LA time to get through security and all the rest, which means I need to start the hair and makeup process at about half past eight. So do you do your own? No, that would be silly. I have very, very, very curly hair. Think do you? Charlene from Neighbours hair. Think Kylie in the oh. Charlene days. And I was told in no uncertain terms as soon as I arrived at Channel 10 when I started that that's not suitable for television. So, um, I see. So I need a good blow dry. So what there is in LA, there's this fabulous place down the road from my hotel on Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood called Dry Bar. And they're all over the place. I think place. they're a chain, yeah. Yeah, they're a chain. And you go in and you get a blow dry for 45 bucks and it takes three quarters of an hour. They do a wash and a blow dry. And then right next door is this place called Blushington. And they do the same with makeup. And so you go from one to the other, get your hair done, then you go next door and you get your face done. And I presume work pays for this. Yes, work pays for that. But to hire a hair and makeup artist in LA Mm. costs thousands and thousands of dollars. So this is a much more budget-friendly way to do it. And it's also like a lot of the um, publicists for nominees or wives of producers and things go there. There's still an echelon of the awards crowd that goes to this Blushington salon to do this. So you get lots of good info and, and, and intel while you're there too. So it's a, it's a double whammy. Then I go back to my hotel and inevitably I have to make a phone call to the staff begging for someone to come and help me do up my frock because I'm on my own. <laughs> How do you know what to wear? You do have to wear black tie. That is the rule. And has to, the Oscars particularly insist on a full length gown so you can't get away with it. Even a short, for media. Even for media. Even though most of you is hidden behind a, the oddly placed um, hedge. 
that uh, is between you and the talent. We'll get to the hedge in a minute because that sounds fascinating. It, it is, yes. How do you choose what to wear? Have you got a few dresses? Do you never um, wear the same thing twice? Oh, no, I, I wear the same thing twice. So what I do is I find a, a dress, I buy a dress um, each year that I can wear. I wear one at one of the American Awards and one at one of the awards here, so at either the Logies or the... Um, actors here and I'll wear it at the Globes or G'day or the Oscars in LA on the basis that nobody apart from Richard Wilkins is going to see me in both. both. (laughs) So So you only get two wears out of every dress? Oh no, then I wear it to charity functions and balls and other things that I am seeing. And on TV. Yeah, yeah. so it gets lots of wear but they'll be their first two wears and then I hang on to them. So I just go on my gosh, I just, um, and how big or small it is at the time. (laughs) Does it have to feel, like do you do the whole thing? Spanks thing, and do you I, have I spanks to feel up. absolutely? I and, spanks up, and yet you're on your feet for yeah. how long? All in all, so by the time I'm dressed, so I'll, I'll be on the red carpet from about 11 a.m. till the ceremony starts, which is generally at 4:30 or 5 p.m. So I do all my interviews on the red carpet. Then I go backstage where I'm in an interview room back there for when the winners come out as they win during the show. And then after that, I usually have to do a, another live cross for the news. And I write my story while I'm backstage for the news. So I've got the iPad going. So at the Oscars the other year when they got it wrong, mm. I'm sitting backstage. I've had this kind of long day and I've just written. And in a Hollywood fairy tale ending, La La Land, one best picture. Angela Bishop, 10 Eyewitness News, send. Ah, and then there you go. Guys, oh, I'm sorry. No. There's a mistake. This, there's a mistake. Moonlight, you guys won best picture. Moonlight won. Come on, I, this is not a joke. This is not a joke. I'm afraid they read the wrong thing. This is not a joke. Moonlight is one best picture. And I just went, oh, my God, no. And I'm backstage and the place was pandemonium. You know in movies when some catastrophe happens in a, in a room or an office or something, someone inevitably throws a big wad Pile of, of papers. papers in the air? Yeah. That actually happened. The woman in the corner Jeez. of my room actually threw a whole lot of papers in the air and I thought, oh, this is serious. I then had to run in my frock and shoes about – a kilometre back from where I was backstage out back onto Hollywood Boulevard where I'd managed to talk a cameraman who I knew was working for someone else into giving me a a shot for 15 minutes to go live to tell the news what had happened and quickly cross live out on Hollywood Boulevard and then So is it your cameraman? No, I borrowed one from APTN, which is like a higher service for want of a better word, AP, who who rent their camera app, but we hadn't had a booking. It was just that I knew him and I was able to squeeze in. Because you weren't expecting to have to do a live cross. So I was just able to squeeze in a five-minute booking there. So 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 adrenaline kicks in in that moment. Adrenaline kicks in. And you go, this is going to be huge. And you just, you go... This is it. This is everything. Pandemonium has just broken and, and all of this. And then the rest of my package was already sent and was being cut and, and is ready to go. Then after that, I'll probably do a cross for the project. And then I go to the parties. And so occasionally I do my crosses for the project from the parties. And just do you go inside on the parties the or do yeah, you have no, to wait I'm, outside I'm, No, I'm a guest. Parties. I'm a guest. So I'm fortunate enough after all the hundreds of years I've been going that I get invited to quite a few of them. So I was at the Fox party um, at the Oscars with Rami Malek and Brian May and Roger Taylor from Queen after Bohemian Rhapsody got all its awards, which and is nice. And are you working or are you there as a guest? I'm there as a guest. I was having a glass of champagne and, I mean, do I talk about it the next day and say this was their reaction? Sure, but... I suppose you can still call that work, I guess. So I'll, I'll put another couple of hours on the clock there then. <laughs> and when they're talking to you at that party, are they wary because they know your media it's, or is there an unspoken thing that we're off the clock? It's funny. So with, with Rami and Brian and Roger, I'd been interviewing them throughout the, and I'm going to use the J word, journey, from um, <laughs> from when the movie came Drink. out. Drink. <laughs> from when the movie came out to to the Oscars, which is the beginning and ending of any movie's life. And um, Brian actually uh, backstage at the Golden Globes thanked me for my support of the film after I'd asked a question and said, you know, you've you've backed this film all the way and we really do appreciate that, Angela, which was nice, you know, that he doesn't have to say that in front of all the media backstage, which was really lovely. So they know that... You know, they can I trust would only, you. I would only say, and, and not that they did or said if anything. If they're vomiting in a corner, you won't. Yeah. You know, but get to a live cross. I think after all these years, they're they're a bit beyond that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there was nothing illicit to report. These were people who were just on cloud nine, felt that their 
very dear friend, Freddie Mercury, had mm. been beautifully celebrated. His life had been celebrated in a fairly magical way. And they were quite emotional, mm. um, but it was, a, it was a very happy place to be. So by the time you get home, mm-hmm. you so, started getting ready in the morning. Yeah, so I've, been, I've probably been up since 7.30 and by the time I get back to the hotel and have to find someone to undo the dress, again, an orc, or Toad's Orcs question what, to ask. Who, who does it? I just usually go, have you got a female employee downstairs who could help me unzip my dress? Uh, Jane Fonda classically posted a shot of herself on Instagram one night after she got back from an event. She didn't have anyone to undo a dress and she posted a photo of herself the next morning. She'd slept in the dress because she couldn't get out of it. <laughs> it's a very um, yeah, unveiled photo. That. Yeah. But it's a first world problem, sure. I can't get out of it's my black tie frock after being at the Oscars. So it's usually maybe about two or three by the time. Do you, do you- have a lot of coffee? Do you have Red Bulls? I don't drink coffee. What do you do? I have been known to slide a Red Bull or two in the following day because, of course, I'm back on air the next day to do Studio 10 and the news again. But no, I'm pretty good. I, yeah, obviously, I don't write myself off. I have about two glasses of champagne and just, you know, enjoy myself, have a good time. Is it mm. fun? It is. I know that sounds ridiculous. No, it doesn't. Um, it sounds good. It, it's fun. It'd want it, to be fun because just, you've been on your feet for a long time. But by the same token, every time I'm standing on that red carpet at the Oscars or at the Golden Globes, I pinch myself. I grew up watching it on television the same as everyone else. And um, for actors and actresses, uh, you know, that's the epitome of their of their career. If they ever get to be there, mm. I get to be there every year. Is there an art to getting someone to stop to talk oh to you? Oh, my God. How do you do that? Because that, to me, feels really demeaning. It is. Oh, it's absolutely um, throwing yourself. You're yelling. You're screaming. It's embarrassing. So with the people I know, I tee them up and I tell them roughly where I'm standing and uh, talk to their publicists and sort of say, you know, yeah, we, we will be about here and so forth. But then you, there are random people. You never know who's going to arrive from year to year. So what I've found the most effective thing is literally I have an Australian flag and I stick it in the hedge and when I see someone, I go, I go come and talk to Australia and be surprised how many people respond to that. You know, international stars just like the idea of talking to Australia. Secondly, there's quite a few people who I've talked to many times, so that helps. So they sort of they'll come to a familiar face. And the newest trick I've learned is um, I've got a a ring light that I put around the camera. Now, you know how when you're doing selfies and you've got one here in the room. do. That a selfie looks much better when you've got the ring light. Well, so so do you on camera rather than relying on those horrible lights that the people putting the red carpet put in. So the celebrities are like, I'll go. Celebrities go, that's a good light. Wow. And they'll walk over. Because, for instance, at the Emmy Awards a few years ago, it was 44 degrees. And everyone's makeup was running and the boys' shirts were sticking to their body and so forth. And nobody wanted to be on camera. Like we were really struggling to get people to come and be photographed because they knew that their hairdo Mm. had fallen and they looked bad. So if you're going to make them look good and you've got a nice light, it's another handy trick. Just picked up. Who is really nice and will always stop and who is really a hard get? Um. People like Helen Mirren, Dame Judi Dench, uh, I I suppose I say that the old guard, the people who've been doing this for a long time, but but maybe success, the real top success came to them a bit later. They are fantastic. Now, not only will they stop for a chat, but they really give considered answers. They really think about the answer and, and offer something. Helen Mirren's response the year that Me Too happened, remember, and everyone wore mm-hmm. black to the Golden Globes. She'd thought about it. She had some great comments to make. It wasn't just a, a cliche or a, or a, a motherhood statement like we got from a few people, which is fair enough because they've got to do the whole carpet and you don't expect everyone to give a personal anecdote and a full analysis of the situation. But when someone does, it's pretty bloody good. Mm. And so Meryl Streep is always fantastic. Nicole and Keith are always gorgeous. Kate Blanchett's always fabulous. Any given Hemsworth is superb. Mm. Miley's also a cracker. Mrs Hemsworth now. Uh, and she has changed her name, which I thought was good. I've had some good experiences with... Uh, I got to interview the Fonz at the Emmys oh, last Henry year. Winkler. Henry Winkler. And I don't know, there's something about interviewing someone that you grew up oh, watching yeah. on the telly all these years later, and he was so chuffed to be in this nomination. He hadn't been nominated for an Emmy since 
happy days. Mm. And he was so chuffed to be back in this world. And he was just excited and he was happy and he was giving such great interviews. And, you know, the little ones like that, which are totally unexpected, were just great. Is it true that the... I'm going to use a word that's not very nice, but the most desperate people come early and the most famous people come at the end. Desperate's a bit unkind. That's a bit unkind. There's but probably the, the, more more of a hierarchy based on the categories, if yeah. you like. So you'll get um, the people who write the score and the screenwriters. Uh, and the, often they're our Australian nominees. So we, mm. we don't count them as desperate. We count them as the as the ones we're barracking for, the editors and the screenwriters, for so instance. So their best chance of getting coverage yeah, is to come early and not be come. having to compete with Angelina and Beyonce. Exactly right. And then you've got the ones who are right, right at the top, the really super, super big stars. So your Gaga, it would have been this year, who just swans down the car but naturally doesn't you know, Talk to anyone because she doesn't have yeah, to. she doesn't have to. Or, and also she's probably due on stage in about 30 seconds. So. Who else doesn't have to stop? Well, nobody has to, I suppose. But in that really upper echelon, you've got people like Beyonce, who's turned up at quite a few, a few of the award ceremonies. She doesn't, she doesn't need to stop and have chats. She's pretty covered. But then again, she might. If she just sees someone who takes a fancy, sometimes they just come over and do it because they, they do seem someone. The Cloonies don't need to stop probably. But having said that, I've been at events where he has stopped and literally talked to everyone and Mm. given everyone just a little gem of a something because he's charm personified. Whereas Leonardo DiCaprio, probably not so much. He's not that boisterous, do you know what I mean? He doesn't Mm. have that same sort of... He just seems to take things a lot more seriously. He's charismatic in his way, but he's just... He's taking it more seriously, I think, is a better way of putting it, yeah. And then in terms of um, – you don't have a big entourage, so it's interesting what you say about – It's just me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that the work of what you do is so interesting. So, for example, I was interviewing Andrew Denton and he has wow. – he's at the opposite end of you in terms of he does the same thing but in a very different way. So he's got a team of producers and they'll spend weeks – preparing and he'll, you know, cram and then he'll sit down with someone for an hour or two hours and it's a very different thing whereas you have very small amounts of time and you've just got to operate at a different pace and it's just you. Mm -hmm. Just me. What are some of the things that you have to do that people might not think that someone on TV would have to do? Okay. So first of all, I have to be across what they're nominated for and why and have seen everything and all the rest. So that And that's incredibly time-consuming. And, you know, oh, wow, and you had to go and see movies. Bummer. But it's a lot of movies. They're also long these days. And movies some are all of them long. are three hours. And sometimes I want that three hours of my life back, mm. you know. But, you know, it's only fair. I think it's offensive to, especially when you're sitting down for a sit-down interview, people to have not seen their work. I don't do that. I always make sure I have. So I'm going to see all the movies, got to um, make sure I know who's nominated for what. And so so you're prepared for whoever might come. So that's the thing. I've got to basically be prepared for whoever might come. And as I say, and then you get these ones that you kind of weren't expecting, you know, like Jackie Chan or pop up out of nowhere carrying two stuffed dolls. And you go, okay, where am I going to go with this? Well, I'll just ask him why he's got them, you know, and you've got nothing ready, but you've got to just be able to, to wing it. And then the thing is, I need to get something great out of that tiny amount of time. So we've talked about red carpet. Can you explain what the junket's like from your point of view? Because they're the two different parts of your job, aren't they? Yeah, they are. So the best way to describe a junket, I guess if anyone's seen Notting Hill and Hugh Grant goes in and pretends to be from Horse and Hound and finds himself with all those people asking weird questions because clearly he hadn't seen the film, that's pretty much what it's like except it's got television cameras in each room and he was doing a press junket. And and I actually did the junket for Notting Hill, (laughs) which was fantastic. Yeah, which was fantastic. And um, so I spent all day from 9am doing Julia Roberts right through till 6pm when I did Hugh Grant. Um, What's it like for the celebrities? So they go from room to room. The celebrities stay in the room. We go from room to room. And you will be with a group, maybe someone from Brazil or so. Is that how it works? From a bunch of different publications. Yeah. So the idea is for the celebrity to talk to as like groups to really maximise their time. Yeah, but you only go in one at a time. Oh, you go in one at a time. time. But yes, we're we're there. So they'll usually do a day of, if it's an American film, they'll do a day of domestic and a day of international. So domestic's your Entertainment Tonight, Access Hollywood, 
E news, etc., and then the internationals is people like me. So, what do you do when you walk into that room and you have seconds, and they're probably over it because they've mm-hmm. asked, been answering the same questions mm-hmm. for two days? What's your strategy? It differs from person to person. If I've interviewed them before, that's a huge head start. That's great because I'll kind of know their cadence. I'll kind of know how they react. And in a perfect world, if I've bothered them enough over the years, they might even remember me. I often pitch the – I go the sympathy fact and mention that I've just stepped off a 14-hour flight from Australia and uh, and they all go, oh, I'm terrified to do that. And I go, you know. So So that's your go-to small talk? Go-to small talk if if it's someone I think that might work with. The tricky thing with the junket is you have a certain number of questions that you need answered in order to construct a story about what it is they're doing. But then you just need that something that no one else has as well. And you want to surprise and engage them as well. And so I research and I research and I research and I just try to find something that will take me to a different place. So perfect example was um, Harrison Ford last year. Now, Harrison Ford, what question? Well, he's notoriously prickly as well. Well, he's notoriously – he gets bored easily. And can you imagine – so since Star Wars in 1977, how many questions he's been answering. This was for a Star Wars film. I mean, God, I, I, I pity the guy. Now, this was 2015, 2016, so before the presidential election, and I'd, I'd found this comment that Donald Trump had randomly made saying he was a big fan of Harrison Ford because of the way he represented the United States in Air Force One when he said, get off my plane. So we knew Trump was running for president at this stage and I just wanted to get his reaction to that. And, and his reaction was just gold. He just looked down the barrel of the camera and he goes... The uh, beloved Donald Trump? The beloved Donald Trump. running for... Um, president of the resident? United States of the America. Oh, president? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was resident. <laughs> so he's not only going to live there, he's going to run the show? It's his plan. No, it's not so much. No, I don't think so. So the fact that he's what did he say? He said he was a fan of you. That Uh um, he loved the way you stood up for America in Air Force One. Get off my plane! (laughs) It's a movie. And he liked. uh, mm. And he liked the way. (laughs) It was a movie. It's not like this in real life. But how would you know? (laughs) Thank you for the opportunity. That chunk of the interview with him and me ended up on. The CBS Nightly News, the NBC Nightly News, like the major news bulletins in the United States, BBC in London. It so went that's in, the old in actual newspapers, like actual newspapers, you yeah. know, like the Washington Post. And um, that was from a five-minute junket with a man who's done more junkets than probably any human being on earth. So every now and then you just – it just happens. And and you know it. at the Like my, my heart was doing little somersaults going – Oh, my God, that is yeah, everything. because you know that you've that got it. That is everything it's I like, need. Thanks yeah. and goodbye. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much. Let's not spoil this by going in further. What about conditions and things that you're not allowed to ask? I really so rarely come up against that. For instance, so Kim Kardashian had her famously short marriage, the 52-day marriage, mm-hmm. and she had interviews scheduled in Australia the day that news broke, and I was the first one first television interview and it was with her and Chloe and I thought oh here we go we're going to get told oh, she might cancel or, or we'll be told no questions or steer clear of that whatever nothing so all credit to her at what must have been you know not a good time for, did you ask I, I asked and she answered how are you feeling today I mean you know it's it's a hard time right now but I really wanted to stay committed to you know, coming out here, this was a prior commitment that we made, and I didn't want to, you know, bail on our, you know, line of handbags here that we have worked so hard to develop. And, um, you know, I just I kind of wanted to escape and, and come out here. And Chloe answered too. And so I had a little world exclusive on my hands. Thanks very much for, uh, you know, to, to go out. And, and I thought, that's amazing. And I actually think that celebrities would have a much better time of it if instead of saying they don't want to talk about this, please don't talk about this, if they just have a really quick little remark, ready? Yeah. Do it. It's done. It's dusted. Our box is ticked. Your box is ticked. It's covered. And then you move on. And somebody who's been doing it for long enough knows how to move the conversation on. 
They know how to give a little bit of an answer and then take it off in another direction. So it sounds like you are able to read a room and read a person really fast. Hopefully. And all your 30 years of experience has allowed you to improvise, I guess, depending on what is going to get the best outcome and meet the person where they are because they might be exhausted, they might be manic. You don't know. Hopefully, I, I, I wouldn't guarantee I'm like that. I'll, I'll tell you one time I pushed the envelope and it was the Notting Hill junket. So I'd arrived in um, London on the Saturday morning and I was doing actually a one-hour special out of this junket on Notting Hill, the film. So I'd had to shoot hostings all day on Portobello Road in Notting Hill. So I was battling planes, markets, cars, everything. You know, have to do 17 takes of everything. It was exhausting. I was in London for one night. So I told everyone I knew in London that I was there for one night. So we all went out to dinner. And we went out late. I think I got back at two. And I had to be up interviewing Julia Roberts at nine. And then I had Rhys Evans. I had all the cast all the way through the day before Hugh Grant at at 6pm. Full day of interviews. So you can imagine by the time I got to 6pm, I was absolutely exhausted. And I was standing outside and I was next to go in to interview Hugh. And I heard him say to his publicist, "Um, I'm feeling a bit tired. Um, Let's see if we can take a bit of a break uh, before this next one. Now, I had to go from that interview to the airport to fly back again to get the special made in time for it to go to air. And I just went, you're tired? I walked into the room and went, you're tired? Can I tell you about tired? This is tired. I flew in from Australia yesterday morning, 24 hours on a flight, filmed um, hostings all day yesterday for your film, had to see my friends last night, went out, probably got home too late, probably had one champagne too many, but nevertheless showed up, ran with the foxes, got up with the hounds. The next morning I did your beautiful co-star Julia Roberts at 9 o'clock, being interviewing all day. You are my last one before I go and get onto the plane, sit in my seat and sleep nonstop for the next 24 hours. Can we just do this now? And I thought, oh, my God, either he's going to just say that's it you're gone and I don't have my key interview yeah fortunately he just cracked up laughing and goes yep no we'll do I think we'll do Miss Bishop now if you'd like to sit her down like this and blah 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 which that was a calculated risk it wasn't even a calculated risk in retrospect it was very dangerous but it was just genuinely how I was feeling well they also (laughs) do say that your gut instinct is actually a woo-woo name for everything you've learned Maybe. But that, Over that the last was, 30 years. But that was early days. But it worked. That was early days. It was 1999, I suppose. So I hadn't been doing it all that we'll, long. F- we'll find that one under chutzpah. Chutzpah. But he was great. So I've loved Hugh Grant to this day. The last time I saw you was on the red carpet at the Big Little Lies premiere in L.A., Oh, yes. So that was my first proper LA red carpet, probably your 10,000th. And I remember thinking, gosh, I really must sit down with Ange and do an interview because her life must be really interesting and I'm interested in how she manages it because I knew you had a daughter, your little girl Amelia, and you were married and you were flying back and forth. And I was like, and I think you said to me, this is my fifth trip to LA and it was something like the 1st of February this year. You said it's my fifth trip this year and I was just interested in the logistics of your life. Of course, what I didn't know, that was a couple of years ago now, that your husband was really sick at the time, Pete, and he died about a year ago. I'm so sorry. November 2017. I'm so sorry for that happening to you and to Amelia. How are you? (laughs) Loaded question. Loaded question. Um, I'm... I'm okay some days. Uh, Some days I am toast. I'm absolutely cactus. And the really hard part is I cannot for the life of me predict which is going to be which. You would think, you know, I can predict that Father's Day is going to suck, and it did. I can predict that certain anniversaries aren't going to be great. So last year, for instance, I was covering the royal wedding of Harry and Meghan in Windsor. And they got married on the 19th of May and our wedding anniversary was the 22nd of May and that was my first wedding anniversary without Pete. And I was actually sitting on a plane by myself coming home on that day. So that wasn't a fun trip. But that makes sense because that's an anniversary so I'd expect to be sad on that day. But other days it'll be something so random. It'll be a song comes on the radio or it'll be... A smell of something that, you know, I'll tell you what the last one was. So I was in London waiting for the royal baby and um, 
I went to see uh, All About Eve with Gillian Anderson and Lily James starring in it in the West End. And I just got on the tube, walked to the theatre without thinking about really where I was. And when I walked out of the theatre, I found myself in St Martin's Lane, which is a part of London, but it's where Peter and I took our first overseas trip together. And we stayed in the St Martin's Lane Hotel and the pub that I walked out of the theatre and saw was the pub where we had drinks and had all these magic times. And I just burst into tears in the middle of the street in mm. St Martin's Lane as all these people were walking out of the theatre and I lost it and I couldn't stop crying. And I literally had to walk back into that hotel because it was the only place I could think of going and, and go into the bathroom and find some tissues and clear myself up. So it's just these unexpected moments and you just utterly, like I, it's like I can't speak, I can't breathe, even this far mm. on. is so, just so hard to cope with. How old's Amelia? Eleven. How did you prepare her? Um, I don't know. We honesty. I'll be honest. We we gauged that she's very smart. So any questions that she asked, we answered. We didn't offer more information than she asked. We answered her questions, and always I will do that. That I think worked, and um, you know, just spend as much time together as we could, just how, and did ridiculously fun things when we were able to. How did you guys meet? Oh dear! <laughs> Those who are listening to this in Sydney and are of a certain age will have heard of a place called Minsky's. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Thank you. I can tell from your reaction that you have. And for those who haven't, who don't live in Sydney and aren't of a certain age, it's a, it's a piano bar. And a man called John Watson uh, has been playing the piano there, I think, since the 80s, long before I was old enough to go there. And he plays, you know, Billy Joel, Elton John, all those sort of songs. And a lot of people, very famous people, have found themselves there over the years having a sing-along at the end of an evening. And it was Chinese New Year and I was, uh, it was 2002 and I was not in the mood to be out. I'd been dragged out by my, by my friends because my father had just been diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer. And my friends decided that uh, he was having surgery in a few days and my friends decided that um, I just needed a night out with friends and just forget about things for a little while. So out I went. So that night by the time I got to Minsky's I was stone cold sober and was about ready to pull the pin and go home. When I, um, I basically met Pete, he'd gone there with a bunch of friends too. And, um, yeah, it was an instant connection. I can't describe it. It's, it's like a bolt of lightning came through to me and said, this is the person you're meant to be with. It was bizarre. I, I, I can't explain it. He didn't work in media. No, he he's a mechanic. <laughs> he didn't work in your world or your industry. He wasn't. He was a New Zealander. You were the daughter of a very famous Australian he, politician. Who he wouldn't have known from a bar of soap. But we just had, we had an enormous amount in common despite those differences and um, and just had an immediate connection. And so much so that just three weeks later, he invited me to his sister's wedding, to Wendy's wedding. Um, which is unusual, you know, that's mm. not, you don't sort of go to the, the realised weddings that early into a relationship, a but deal. we sort of had that, that feeling. So we we're at the wedding and um, long into the afternoon, you know, probably several Sauvignon Blancs into the afternoon, I found myself at one of those tables where you're asking people around the table what they do. And I was talking to this woman who was a friend of Wendy's. So her partner was a friend of Wendy's husband. So this is not someone I would have ever met in any mm. other time of life. And I said, she's, I said to her, what do you do? And she goes, I work in a pharmaceutical company. And my father, this rare cancer that he had, um, anyone who had it died after six months, but there was an experimental drug, which we'd been reading about called Gleevec, which was available if you had about $200,000 or so, and you could try to get it from the United States, which had been showing some uh, efficiency with what he had, which was a gastrointestinal stromal tumour, a gist. 
And we were trying to track it down, you know, and we're trying to work out how we could afford to get it and whether we could get it into the country and all this sort of thing. So this woman across the table says to me, yeah, I work for a pharmaceutical company. I go, oh, you don't make Gleevec, do you? And she goes, how the hell do you know what Gleevec is? And I said, well, my father has just been diagnosed with a gastrointestinal stromal tumour and apparently we need some. And she goes, oh, no, you need some. And uh, she said, but we need someone to be on a trial for it in Australia to get it through the PBS. And we, what we need is someone who hasn't been misdiagnosed and given any chemo. Has he been misdiagnosed and given any chemo? I said, no, this has all happened in the last four weeks. He hasn't been given anything. And so two weeks later, he was on a trial for this trial drug and he lived for eight years. Wow. Plus he went on the speaking circuit and spoke at the hearings to get it put on the PBS for other people who came along. And it's now not only the drug for GIST but also for chronic myeloid leukaemia. It's the drug that beautiful Elle Halliwell's taking. Oh, that's um, extraordinary. And so it's just serendipity um, and kind of meant to be. But the irony of my husband then to get a different rare cancer just is hard to cope with and we didn't have the same How long fortune. did you have from his diagnosis? 22 months and no one... We, so the cancer he had um, is three cases in a million and um, nobody who's had it has lived beyond 24 months. And he fought. He fought so hard. He really did. When you were away, I was thinking, gosh, her husband must be an interesting guy because... You spend a lot of nights at on red carpets. Award ceremonies don't happen in office hours. Mm-hmm. Um, LA is far. It's the furthest place you can fly in one go, I think, 16-hour flights. And I thought he must be a real co-parent to your daughter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely he was. But we kind of knew my life going in before we had Amelia. We knew what we'd be facing. So we'd, we had thought that through. Um, and my trips to LA, while they are along my way, I go for the absolute minimum amount of time. I've gone over and back in one day. So what do you do about Amelia now? So my mum, the on bron, as we call her, has been incredible, uh, but she still works, of course. She's on Sky News, and um, so I have a couple of great girls who also help out, and so between and they help me out when I'm here too, and so between all of that... Um, we make it work. The transition to being a single mother is not something that you had ever planned, but in a way you had time to prepare for. Do you know I didn't? Because all the time I didn't believe it was going to happen. Because that would have seemed defeatist. That would have seemed like I was assuming that we couldn't beat this and I really believed we could. I thought if anyone could, he could. So, no, I wasn't prepared. We had a holiday planned that Pete was going to come on because um, although, you know, he was in a pretty good uh, place just before Christmas that year and we were going to go to Uluru together because um, he'd always dreamed. He's he's a mad motorcyclist. Not a mad motorcyclist, a great motorcyclist. He used to ride race motorbikes in New Zealand and he was a great rider. used to take Amelia for rides and it was one of her greatest thrills. And he'd always wanted to ride a motorbike around... Uluru. Mm. And so we had the trip booked and we'd actually had to move it a couple of other times when he'd, um, you know, when treatment had been in such a place that we couldn't go. But we were looking on track to make it for this particular trip and then things took a a, a very sudden turn. Um, And so Amelia and I sat down and looked at each other and we said, will we still go? And we said, yes, we'll still go. And um, we went for the ride around Uluru with a couple of wonderful blokes um, who had Harley Davidson's up there and the the one who took Amelia for a ride was called Peter and he was from New Zealand and it was just so spiritual and healing to be in that part of Australia. I think it's the most special part of our country and um, yeah, it, it was watching some sunsets, watching some sunrises, just being in a place of complete silence and respect um was the best place for us to start, I suppose, planning for the new normal, whatever that would be. 
I've spoken to a number of women who've lost their partners and interestingly they've all taken their kids away on holidays. There's something about, I don't know if it's making a fresh memory or showing your kids that mum can do this, yeah. we, we can do this, we're a different shaped unit now and yeah. it's going to be okay. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it just felt like exactly the right thing to do. And then, um, so she came with me to the next Golden Globes, which were in January, and she got photographed holding a Golden Globe. I mean, hello. <laughs> She's had some wild experiences. That's since. a very good way to get someone to come over and talk to you at the red carpet, <laughs> just <laughs> waving your daughter. Forget the flag. Oh, she wasn't, no, she wasn't on the carpet. That, you should that, have tried. That wouldn't work, no. <laughs> Please say hello to this small child. Don't break her heart. Yeah, Crush yeah. her dreams. I could work that. You're absolutely right. I think right. you I'm could not, work that. Just put a ring light around her head. a technique on that. I'm loving Give her a flag to hold. You got the She's th- actually so good she could do me out of a job just quietly. So, uh, yeah, But I might think about it. Um, yeah. And the other, the other thing is the absolute worst thing about um, being – on a day-to-day basis is I have to be good cop and bad cop. So I've got to do the homework, get to bed, get the shower, do this, do that. Plus, let's have some fun. So when we have fun, we really throw, you know, if there's a weekend and we're supposed to do a whole lot of things, we will just not do them and go and do something that we need to do. Mm. So walk up the Barangay Lighthouse or drive up the Blue Mountains and go for a bushwalk or go to Luna Park or eat our body weight and M&Ms, whatever, you know. When you look at the future, what do you see? Yeah. Not there yet. I'm not there yet. I don't know when I'm going to be there. I mean, work-wise, that provides stability and I know, you know, what's going there and I've got a couple of things I'm trying to get happening as well on top of all of that and, you know, so that much but beyond that. Uh, getting Amelia ready for high school, that's a big priority. That's such a big change. Mm. Um, Pete left me excellent uh, shotgun instructions for when the first boyfriend <laughs> arrives. So I've got all that under control. Um, start preparing to have to teach her to drive, which he was definitely going to do because he's the best at that. Um, things like that. Um, but beyond that, no, nah, it's too soon. I don't know. don't know how to look. It should be fine. I mean, teenage girls are so easy. That's right. I'm sure you gave your mother no Actually, problems. I was a piece of cake. I'm just going to say. Really? And mum's even Were said you? that. Mum's even said that. She has said how lucky she was. And so I deserve some karma in that direction. I'm just going to put that out to the world. I think you deserve some karma for lots of reasons. But um, And Amelia's actually said to me, bless her cotton socks, she goes... I'm going to be a great teenager, Mum, and I constantly remind her of that. Please, please sign your name against that <laughs> Sorry, statement. Just time-coded that <laughs> and a statutory declaration. This was said by Amelia Bakey on this and such and such a day. Has deciding to do Studio 10 given you more stability? Like why did you make that decision? Um, I really needed a challenge at that point in time. That, that came at exactly the right time for me. It was like great. Not that I was coasting in any way on what I was doing, doing otherwise but just something to sink my teeth into and to be able to stretch out of the entertainment world um you know way back 30 years ago I studied political science at uni so to suddenly find myself hosting an extended edition of the show because Sarah was away that day um when the last leadership uh challenge happened so that was leadership challenge number 10 I believe uh you know, the, the ScoMo, um, Malcolm Turnbull one, to find myself hosting the show on that felt really good. It was like I was exercising, flexing some muscles that hadn't been used for a long time. Um, but I think we still made it an entertaining show because if you like, you're still stuck with the entertainment reporter half of me as well, if you like. So we sort of had um, a mix and we had Sam Dastiari on the panel and we had mm. – and Joe Hildebrand, of course, and at a very lively bunch of people. So it made for an interesting um, show, but I think it was good fun. And is it nice having the family of, of being in part of a cast after mm. travelling solo, particularly at this time after losing Pete? Definitely, definitely. And and I can't tell you how amazing um, the team, both the news and, uh, and Studio 10 teams and the beautiful publicity team mm, too. They just so, put their arms around you. Yeah. It's been incredible. And, and I mean, 
So in 30 years at 10, they've seen me arrive straight out of uni, um, meet my husband, get married, have a child and lose that husband all in the same time I've worked there. So it does feel like an extension of my family in that way. Mm. I think there are a lot of people who don't work at Channel 10 who also love you, Ange, who, who see really you nice and it. feel close to you and invested in you and um, can see the future, even if you can't yet. There is one and um, it sounds cliche to say it's pretty bright, but just I guess it's one day at a time at the moment. 100%. Giving you love and hugs. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of No Filter and thanks to Ange for being so vulnerable and brave is kind of an overused word, but, you know, it was really moving to sit there with her and like you, I've seen her on red carpets and I've met her many times, you know, behind the scenes and she's always just so incredibly effervescent and professional and strong and to see this side of her was incredibly moving and just such a human moment and I think it's something that I don't know we've all got our our personal struggles that we deal with don't we and um, I know that a lot of people will really be kind of comforted uh, and feel seen and understood by what she had to say. If you're wondering what to listen to next, can I recommend our Family Life podcast, This Glorious Mess? It's usually hosted by Holly Wainwright and Andrew Datto, but this week we've replaced Andrew with not another Datto, but possibly the person in the world who's the most polar opposite of Andrew Datto, and that's Megan Gale. She is an absolute hoot. It's a great episode. And um, this isn't just a podcast for people with little children. It's one of our most popular podcasts with women who don't have children, women who might want to have children one day, people with children of all ages. It's really just looking at uh, family life and it's just, it's so funny. Anyway, have a listen to This Glorious Mess. We'll put a link in the show notes and a shout out to everyone who replied and messaged me and called in the pod phone and emailed us about our anxiety podcast last week, uh, my interview with Dr. Jody Lowinger. I was not surprised at the reaction, but it's been a long time since I've heard from so many people to say, I felt seen and heard and understood and I sent this to my friend and I sent this to my partner and I sent this to my kids or my parents. It was just such an interesting conversation. I've suffered from anxiety for a long time, but I learnt so much from what Jodie said and I've got her words really ringing in my head a lot of times about about the worry bully. So if you somehow missed this, go back into your feed and have a listen. And if you know anyone in your life with anxiety, please think about sharing it with them um, because it is really just helping so many people. Until next week, this podcast, No Filter, was produced by Eliza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman and I will see you on mamamia.com.au.